Brady, <coughs> Ella. <coughs> well, this is fantastic. You know, you know, this this is really, really good. Probably because my oldest son is here. Okay. <coughs> All right. So. You have no idea, but uh, this is fantastic, all right? <laughs> all right, so we have a nice pink flamingo, and we have Samson, right? And so what, do, what in the world are we going to do with this, Ella, right? I don't know, all right? <laughs> I can tell you a story about being in Florida and seeing flamingos and... My son Matthew was able to go up and actually like pet the flamingo. He's like the flamingo whisperer, that kind of idea. Um, but I, I believe, all right, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, somebody can, it doesn't have to be just Ella, that don't they eat with their heads upside down? Don't they flip their heads over when they eat? No? Do I have the wrong bird? Yes, I get a thumb. Yes! <laughs> Bailed out. All right. Which seems really, really weird, right? Which seems really odd. Can you imagine, like, if you had to eat by turning your head upside down, right, and eating? And so here's where I'm going to go. Like, if you look and you, you heard even prayers this morning about just our world and our culture, and it seems really, like, upside down, right? And we're going to look at Samson. And Samson is a guy who just seemed to be really, really upside down. But we can still learn a lot from him. All right, and so I want to encourage you, as you hear these stories, right, as you hear Samson, we can learn from him, even though you might be like, this, this guy's just all kind of messed up and backwards, we can still learn from him, right, and that's the beauty of God's word, is that he teaches us through his word and through the people that are in his words, okay, so always know that you can learn from him and from his word, okay, Ella, even though it might seem upside down, okay, <laughs> super, all right, um, Samuel, would you like to do the box next week? Sure. sure, all right. Now listen, I'm not here next week, all right? Matt, the guy in the back is preaching, so your job <laughs> is to make it the most difficult thing you can possibly think of <laughs> and put it in the box, okay? Because <laughs> we love Matt. All right, so we are going to be, we're going to be in uh, Judges chapter 16. Um, this is Samson and Delilah. And so what I'm going to tell you right out of the gate is simply this, right? If you grew up in church, right, if you grew up going to Sunday school, you, you, you know this story most likely, all right? Now, if you didn't grow up in church, if you're not familiar with this story, I'm going to say right now that you may have more of an advantage than those who know the story, right? Because it is so, it's one of these familiar stories, okay? So I'm going to try to, like, unpack it a little bit and present it in maybe a little bit of a different way, kind of. And at the end of this sermon, um, and we will get to the end at some point, I have, like, eight or nine things that we need to kind of talk about um, when it comes to not just Samson, yes, but, like, judges, because we're at a transition point. Samson is the last judge um, specific judge we read about in the book of Judges, and then from 17 on, it's about the nation, it's about civil war, it's about idolatry, and it just you just see like just the nation itself kind of collapsing in on itself. And so we kind of we're transitioning this week into that, and so we need to kind of talk about Judges 1 through 16 and kind of maybe recap that, and then before we transition to 17, that'll all hopefully makes sense uh, this morning. But last week, uh, you might remember, we, t we talked about Samson when he returned to Timna. There was a situation. His father-in-law gave Samson's wife or his daughter to his best man, and then it was just reaction after reaction after reaction, and it was really just revenge after revenge after revenge, right? But then at the end of this, end of that account in Judge, uh, Judges 15, Samson became aware Right, that he, he recognized that it was God's presence, it was God's power that gave him the victory over the thousand Philistines with the jawbone of the donkey. Okay, and that actually was, I believe, that was the beginning of his 20 years of judging Israel 
And then we now, with Samson and Delilah, we have the end of that. So we kind of almost bookend. We don't really know a whole lot about the in-between times. We see kind of the beginning, and we see the end of his time as a judge. But what I would like to do um, is I want to read Judges 16 for you. It's all 31 verses. We'll get through it. I would ask you to please stand um, for the reading of God's Word this morning. And then I will pray for us. And uh, we, will, we will have fun this morning as we learn together. Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he went into her. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. And they kept quiet all night, saying, let us wait till the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose, and he took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and pulled them up, bar and all. And he put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Seduce him. And see where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your strength, your great strength lies, and how you might be bound, that one could subdue you. And Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had men lying in ambush in the inner chamber. And she said to Samson, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as a thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire, so the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you've mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men lying in ambush were in the inner chamber, but he snapped the ropes off his arms like threads. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you've mocked me and have told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into the web. And she made them tight with the pin. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pin, the loom, and the web. And she said to him, How can you say you love me when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him. His soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and he said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lord of the Philistines came up up to her and brought the money in their hands. And she made Samson sleep on her knees, and she called the man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. 
And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as any other time and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistine seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, our god has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And their, when their hearts were merry, they said, Call out Samson, that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young man who led him by the hands, let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertains. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once. O oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested. And he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all of his strength. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and buried, brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had judged Israel 20 years. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this story of Samson. Lord, I thank you that you have given us your word, and that you use your word to teach us and to give us instruction. <clears throat> Lord, that these are more than stories. These are more than just accounts. There's lessons to be learned. Lord, there's, there's ways that we should see your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Lord, there's ways that we should see that this story is pointing ultimately to your one and only son, Jesus Christ, and to the beauty and the glory of his gospel. Lord, I pray that you would give us not just eyes to see and ears to hear and minds to understand, my Lord, but hearts that would desire to be changed. Lord, that we would take what we hear this morning and we would apply it to our lives. That we would not just be hearers, that we would be doers. And I pray this all in your name. Amen. God, man, God's redemptive plan, right? <laughs> God, man, God's redemptive plan. So, so Samuel, Samuel, how about Samson, right? Samson began his whole judge thing, right, with this victory at Lehi, right, with the jawbone. And now we read at the end, right, that, it, that his ministry ends, right, in Gaza, when he pulls, pushes down the, the temple on all the, the Philistines, Right, so this is a fulfillment of Judges 13, 5. Right, so you see God's faithfulness. Right, tonight we haven't even gotten into the story. And you see God's faithfulness that he's going to use Samson to begin to bring freedom or relief from his, for his people from the Philistines. And we remember what Samson's mom said, that he was going to be a Nazarite until he, what? Till he died. And so we, we don't even get into the text until we see God's faithfulness oozing out all over the pages. And like I said, back when we started going through Jephthah in Judges chapter 11, we have to be really careful, right, that we don't try to save Samson from himself. Right, this is who this guy was, but yet God still used him. So we have, to, we have to let the rough edges of this story 
kind of be there because God is using that to teach us. It's being used for our instructions. Romans 15, verse, verse 4. Because there's a lot of details missing from this story. A ton of details missing. Right, but what we're going to do, we're going to work our way through this. There's three scenes. The middle scene is the longest scene, by the way. There's three scenes. Scene number one right, is the first three verses, and it's Samson going to Gaza. We don't know really why Samson's going to Gaza, why he felt the need to go there, um, except for that he solicited a prostitute, right, which isn't a surprise, by the way. Right? We, we shouldn't be surprised at all by this. But Gaza was a very important city. Gaza was one of the five capital cities for the Philistines. And in fact, Samson going to Gaza was about as far as he could get from his home and still be in Philistine territory. Okay, and I think there's, there's a reason why. Right? We can draw conclusions from that. And I'll let you draw those conclusions. It's the farthest way he could get from home, but yet still be in the Philistine territory. And obviously, Samson had a reputation that goes way beyond Timnah, right? The people of Timnah knew him fairly well, right? Because all the Philistines seem to have heard about this man because when he's in Gaza, the men of Gaza hear this and they're like, okay, now's our time. We'll set an ambush for this guy. We'll, be really, we'll lie in wait. We'll be nice and quiet. We don't want to disturb him. And then when daylight comes, we'll pounce on him. We'll kill him. He's gone. Life's back to normal in the great city of Gaza. Well, Samson wakes up at midnight and decides to make his way home, perhaps. Again, there's details missing here, right? But he gets up at midnight, and he makes his way out of the city of Gaza undetected. Right? And on the way, he takes the, the gates and the posts and the bars from on the gates and rips them out of the ground with his bare hands, throws them on his back, and carries them roughly 37 miles to this hill opposite Hebron. Hebron, by the way, is the highest city in that region that's kind of west of the, of the Jordan River, so it's kind of a high point. Gaza was more of a coastal town, and so the elevation changed. There's a lot of theories about that. But he's carrying these gates up a hill for 37 miles. And, and listen, there, there's questions, right, that we all have, right? That I mean, I have. Right? How? Right? That there's no spirit of the Lord rushing upon him. There's no hint of that, but we, we know that for this man to, again, one of the five capital cities of the Philistines, these gates are big. Right, but he gets out of his house, he sneaks past how many guards, there probably would have been at least four if not six, a company of guards by this gate. He gets past all those guards, he pulls the gates out with his bare hands, probably not quiet, pulls the gates out with his bare hands and walks away. Right? Well, this is what I think we need to learn from this. Right? This first scene, I try to draw application from every scene. Here, here's the application. The application is the first verse. Okay? Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he went in to her. Okay? Remember the pattern of sin? Right? You see, you desire, and you take. Right? It was, it was, it's Eve in the garden. She saw the fruit, she desired it, and she took it. That's the pattern of sin. And we see it here in this first scene, this pattern of sin. Right? Samson had an issue with sexual sin. He had an issue with, with lust, clearly. It was one of his besetting sins, and when I say besetting sin, I mean simply this, that there was a, there's sin that we have in our lives that we're going to be battling with each and every day of our lives until we meet Jesus. This was Samson's besetting sin, a sin that he should be battling, a sin that he should be fighting against. 
But we don't see him doing that. In fact, we see the opposite. Right? He goes to Gaza, the furthest place he could go from home. And he caves to the temptation. He's not battling his besetting sin. Right? So for me, because I always like to use myself as an example, right? it's helpful for me and for you, and I don't point people out, right? Fear of man, right? We've, I've talked about this. That is a besetting sin of mine. I put more trust in people and what they think than what God thinks. I have to battle that each and every day of my life. And there's ways that you battle that kind of defensively, and there's ways that I need to battle that offensively. It's the same thing with, with, with Samson. It's the same thing with, with sexual sin. There are some times when you just have to be really, really aware and guard yourself and put things in place to protect yourself. I have to put things in place to protect myself against putting too high regard on what people think to the point where I ignore God and what He has for me to do. But there are times when it just kind of happens. And I have a moment where I need to respond. And so we can talk about sexual sin in this way. There are times when you might be, when Samson was, right, weak. Right? I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that the last place Samson should have been going was Gaza. But he goes. He's putting himself in, in harm's way, if you will. When he should have been battling and he should be saying, you want to know what, I, I, I really can't I, can't, I can't go there. It's not a good place for me. <laughs> Sometimes you, you walk down, you walk in the checkout line, right, at Hannaford or Walmart or wherever, and you see the tabloids. And they're, they're just there, and you just see them, and it's just like, <clears throat> and now you've got to battle sin. You've got to battle lust, perhaps. Tim Challies has a, and I have a copy of it here, and I can send this to you if you want. Um, this is fantastic, <laughs> okay? It's four pages. Don't let that scare you. Um, but it is a battle plan for, for sin, right? And, it, and it's very, if, you're like, if you like steps, if you're kind of one of those process people, you'll like this. But it forces you to look at the sin that you're dealing with in your life and develop a plan to battle that sin. Right? These besetting sins. What sin are you battling? How does it manifest itself in your thoughts, in your words, in your actions, in your attitudes? What are some of the words and phrases the Bible uses to describe the sin? What are some patterns and attitudes? It just helps you to go on the offense and think long and hard about the sin that you're battling and the sin that you need to do battle with. And you work your way through this plan, and then there's accountability in this plan about how did you do week after week after week in battling this sin. That's what I think we're supposed to take away from those first three verses is besetting sin. Because ultimately, Samson had his issues, right? But isn't Samson also a mirror of Israel and their idolatry and constantly going after other gods and clamoring after other things but gods? And then isn't ultimately Samson about me and about you and about us and putting other things before God and not battling sin and taking it lightly? Yes, it is. And so we learn from scene one, even with all these unknown things, this idea that God is trying to get the attention of his people, including us, to say, deal with your sin, battle against your sin. Battle. Because now we go to the second scene, and it's, this, this is Samson and Delilah. This is verses 4 through verse 22. 
right? And, and, and we know, right, he didn't learn anything from his, his first wife in Timnah. Samson didn't learn a whole heck of a lot from his time in Gaza. And because we know, because why he ends up here loving a woman named Delilah. Now, Delilah can mean perhaps darkness. And so if you're kind of one of those kind of foreboding people, you think like, okay, so Delilah could mean darkness and Samson's going to have his eyes gouged out and be blind and live in darkness. So, well, okay, that's appropriate. Right? But, Sam, but Delilah can also mean like flirty. Right? And so when you hear her asking Samson, what's the cause of your strength? You know, where's your strength come from? She's probably flirting with him. You know, batting the eyelashes a little bit, maybe standing a little bit differently. But regardless, right, if you've been paying attention through the life of Samson, you realize that Delilah is the first woman that actually has a name. And so we should pay attention, right? Because remember, Samson's mom's uh, unnamed. We know the dad's name is Manoah. His first wife, she's from Timnah, right? His first wife's younger sister, don't know. <laughs> this woman from, from Gaza, but we know Delilah. <laughs> but Delilah ends up having this conversation with the, the, Lord of the, the lords of the Philistines. Okay, so this probably, at a minimum, okay, this probably the five governors or the five mayors of the five capital cities in Philist, in, 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 for the Philistine people. Okay, so there's at least five of them. There could be more, but we're going to say there's five of them. And so these five men come up and they have this conversation with Delilah, right, because Samson has this reputation. After all, he just ripped the gates out of the city of Gaza, right? You've got to um, do whatever you need to do, Delilah, to get the answer for where he gets his strength from. Wh whatever it takes. We, 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 don't, we don't care. You just need to get this answer for us because we want to humble him. We want to humiliate him. We want to oppress him. We want to do him great harm. We want to cause him a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. And so Delilah, who is above and far beneath the people of the whole country, asks them, in fact, you want to know what? We're going to do to you 1,100 pieces of silver. Information for us, you're going to get 5,500 pieces of silver. So we know like where Delilah's commitments lie, right? Here. But to give you an idea of the amount of money that that was, remember back when Gideon right, asked everyone to give the earrings and collect all the earrings to build the ephod, right? They were gold. Um, the, the weight of the gold, the silver pieces, we'll do it this way, weighed about three times as much as the gold that Gideon used to build the ephod. It's a lot of money. It's a ton of money. Just get us this answer by any means necessary. And so she begins this questioning of Samson. Right? And, and you can, right now, you know, okay, so... Darkness, so she kind of already has like this kind of dark, maybe sinister motive, right? Money. Um, but she's also kind of flirty as well, right? And so you can hear it in, in verse 6. Please tell me where your great strength lies, you hunk a hunk of man, you. <laughs> right? And how might you be bound? I mean, if one wanted to subdue you, like, like they're going to really be able to subdue you, look how big and strong you are. But if they wanted to, how could they possibly do that to you? You can hear it. Can't you hear it? You better be able to hear it. Right? And so then there's this, there's this exchange. Right? Santa says, oh, well, if you get seven fresh bowstrings that have never been dried or anything like that, and tie up with those, and I'm going to be like any other guy. You got me. Right? And so the Lord of the Philistines... Bring the bowstrings, right? Delilah ties them up with them, and she has, she has people in her bedroom waiting to pounce on him in the chamber. 
Okay? She's dark and she's sinister. Okay? But anyway, it's Samson, so she calls out, hey, the Philistines are here. It's like, Psh! oh, and like, right? And we, we don't know that he killed those Philistines. We have no clue what he did. But basically, they don't know the cause of his strength. Right? And so then we get ropes. Right? And so she comes back. Right? She comes back to him and says to him, behold. Now remember, whenever you see that word behold, like there's, there's shock here. Right? And so from Delilah's perspective, she's shocked that Samson wouldn't give her the right answer. Right? Now, us reading it, we're not shocked. <laughs> right? We're probably like, yeah, really? It's, well, big surprise, right? Captain Obvious, he didn't do it. Right? So, but there's shock here, and she feels mocked, and she feels lied to. Like, and you can hear her. Can't you just hear her? Oh, man, how could you? Well, if you get seven new ropes that have never been used to do any type of work, and you bind up with those ropes, and hey, you got me, I'll be like any other man. There's also men lying in wait in the chamber to, to ambush him. She ties him up and says, Samson, the Philistines are upon you, and <laughs> breaks the ropes. Again, continues. Samson gets really, really dangerously close with this next one, right? Because it's, remember, it's about his hair, right? So he, like, he starts like, so maybe he's caving a little bit here. We don't really know. But he says, hey, listen, you want to know what? If, um, if you weave my hair, then I'll be like any other. It sounds ludicrous, right? It's just, but anyway, so he had that really long hair. But anyway, you weave my hair, and then I'll, and you, you, you tie it up with a pin, and I'll be like weak like anybody else, like any other man. So while he sleeps, she weaves his hair. Right? So you just, again, just think about the practicality of some of this, right? He's, he's sleeping, but he's not going to wake up while she's weaving his hair. But anyway. She weaves his hair, she shouts, the Philistines are here, Samson. He wakes up, he frees himself, right? He doesn't, psh, this time, he just frees himself, pulls the pen out, boom. He's as strong as strong could be. And we get to verse 15. And she sounds just like Samson's first wife, the woman from, from Timnah. How can you say, I love you? When your heart is not with me, you have mocked me these three times. You have not told me where your great strength lies. And then she presses him day after day with words. Every time he sees her, she's probably weeping a little bit. She's probably sighing, ah, I thought you loved me. Ah, where's this guy? Ah. To the point where he wants to die. He's vexed to death. It's an ultimatum from Delilah. Either open your heart to me and tell me where your strength lies or you lose me. You need to tell me everything, Samson. You need to bear your soul to me. And one of the things you need to bear your soul about is where you get your strength or else I'm out of here. She's felt mocked and disrespected and lied to. She nags, she nags, she nags, and Samson gives in. He caves. But he, he tells her that he's been a Nazarite from before his birth. That God has essentially called him to this. And so in, in a roundabout way, he's confessing that, that he is who he is because this is, this is like his strength comes from, from God. He's got a calling, and he's got a mission. And, and if you cut my hair, then I lose all my strength. So like in this moment of, of weakness, right, Samson confesses this awareness, right, which is, which is good, but then if you think about it, but he's more than willing to have Delilah shave his head than to stay true to the calling that God has put on his life. 
He's more than willing to turn his back and to abandon God right, for the sake of Delilah and having her cut his, his hair. But, but the way that Samson spoke to Delilah in this exchange right, was, had to be unbelievably convincing because she goes to the, Lord of the, the lords of the Philistines and says, hey, listen, he's told me his heart. He, he, he bore his soul to me. This, this, this time, it's legit. He was honest and he was forthright with me. And so the lords of the Philistines obviously believe as well and they show up at Delilah's house with all the cash and say, okay, let's do this. And so Samson falls asleep on the lap of Delilah and she has a man come in and shave his head. And then we read that she began to, to torment him and his strength left him. It wasn't that she began in that moment to mock him because if we read, right, and we pay attention to how she's interacted with Samson, she's been kind of mocking him all along. And it's just this game of, of chicken and cat and mouse between the two of them. But like, this is like the culmination of all of that is right now. His head is shaved. And she wakes him up, right? Same, same words. Right? The Philistines are upon you, Samson. Right? Can't, can't you see Samson waking up? Right? Saying like, hey, this is going to be like every other time. I'll be fine. I don't go out as other times and shake myself free. But then there's this phrase at the end of verse 20 that should, should jump off the page at us. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. That's tragic. We'll come, we'll come back to that in a few minutes. But those are tragic, tragic words. Can you imagine the Lord leaving you? Samson didn't realize that the Lord, that Yahweh, the God who had set him apart to bring relief to his people from the Philistines, the God that had provided this miraculous birth to his parents, that had the, the, the God whose spirit rushed upon him at multiple times throughout his life, it, it left him. And the Philistines grab him, they seize him, they gouge out his eyes and they bring him down to Gaza. They bind him up some more with bronze shackles and they throw him in prison and he works the handmill in the prison making grain for the people of Gaza. So this, this man set apart by God for this work, for this call, for this mission, who was driven by what he could see, finds himself blind. This man who would just come and go as he pleases, hey, I'll go to Timna, hey, I'll go to Gaza, I'll just, wherever I want to go, I'm going to go, is now bound and finds himself a prisoner. This man who made a habit of insulting and humiliating the Philistines, poking fun at them, heaps upon heaps, now finds himself the object of humiliation. This man who had perhaps one of the highest callings of any of the judges, right, if you think about that, is now at the lowest point. Samson, we read about Samson's career as a judge, or his, his, his life beginning with, he saw a woman. He was, she was right in my eyes, and now he's got no eyes. But then this is how you know, like, good stories. 
This is how you should be like drawn into reading these stories in your Bible, is because of the genius of verse 22. But the hair of his head began to grow. Right? When, when, when you get to the end of verse 21, and you're you're just like, man, this is this is tragic, this is this, all is lost, all is hopeless, and you read verse 22. God's not done yet. He's not done. His hair begins to grow. Right? Being abandoned by God right, is, is the worst fate for anyone. For anyone. It's tragic. <clears throat> whether it's personal, whether it's church, this idea of being abandoned by God should make us cherish the gospel at a much deeper level because we're secure in Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us. Right? And that should, right, that should drive us to what? Deal with our sin. Right? You see what God is trying to tell his people through Samson. He's trying to tell us, if you understand this, you should want to deal with your sin. We know how the story ends with Christ. We know it. And so when we read the Old Testament, we can read this back in and be like, man, we, we should be paying attention. Right? You, you, you can't read Samson. You shouldn't be able to read Samson and think like, ah, well, you know what? He kind of got it right maybe a couple times, but... You know, he is who he is. Right? No, your reasons are kind of like, he did what? Gaza? Really? Like, you should be reading it differently. Right? Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about cheap grace and costly grace. I would encourage you to look up Dietrich Bonhoeffer, look, look, up, look that up and read things on this. Because if you, if you don't deal with your sin, right? If you think, ah, I'm good, Jesus has got me, I can live the way I want to live, Life will be fine. That's cheap grace. You don't understand grace. When you get to your sin and you realize the depravity that you have and the sin that you have in your life, you should be like, I've got to deal with this sin. I've got to battle the sin in my life. Lord, help me battle the sin. But God is faithful. He's faithful. And so we get to scene three. And Samson now is he's in Gaza, and the Philistines, right? Like you can you can see this, <laughs> right? You you can see this. There is a party going on in Gaza, right? This dude Samson has been a thorn on our side for twenty plus years. We got him. We got him, right? And you can see Delilah stacking up the money, right? <laughs> I got it, right? Life couldn't be better. In Gaza, they're offering sacrifices to their god, Dagon, because they believe that their god delivered Samson into their hands. We know better than that. God, capital G God, delivered Samson into their hands. And it talks about there being 3,000 people right, in, this, in this, this, this balcony on the roof. Right, there, there were more than 3,000 people there, by the way, because there's a first floor. And so probably all the important dignitaries, the lords of the Philistines and all their buddies were probably hanging out on the first floor. They had a front row seat to this guy, Samson, and looking at this pathetic excuse of a man who has no eyes, bound there. And they're making fun of him and laughing at him. He's entertaining them, and the entertainment thing is that he's just the butt and brunt of all their jokes. They're mocking him, they're ridiculing him, right? They're being unbelievably vindictive, they're deriding him. Right? Here's this great Samson who's now pathetic, he's laughable, <coughs> he's the shell of his former self. In fact, we're going to have a boy lead him in here. That's what happens. They have a boy, a young man, a boy, a teenager probably, to lead him into the temple. Right? 
But since it has to be positioned between these two, these two large pillars that support the structure, and so he's standing there, leaning against these pillars. He's hearing all the laughter and the parting and the whooping and hollering and people poking fun at him. And he calls out to God. O oh Lord God. That's, that's the covenant name for God. That's the God of Israel. That's Yahweh. O oh Lord God. That I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. Give me grace. Show me grace just, just one, one more time. It, it just give me strength for just this, this, this one last time. That I can get revenge on these people for gouging out my eyes. Okay? Motive's a little bit skewed. All right? But he, he, he wants vengeance on the Philistine people. There's, there's desperation in the way that Samson prays to God. And he has no right to expect anything from God. It's, it's, it's the language of a beggar. Remember me. Please remember me. God, we have a relationship. And I'm asking you, on the basis of this relationship that, that, that I have with you, that you would just one last time help He's begging for mercy. It's not a cry of repentance. He's begging for strength to get vengeance on these people for the wrongs that he's suffered. Right? And we don't read about the Spirit of the Lord rushing upon Samson here. We don't read, but we, God is all through this. But doesn't God want the same thing? And here, see, we're getting now, we get into like these kind of deep theological waters here a little bit. But remember, we've got to go back to, to Judges 13. And, and why did God set, up, set apart Samson to begin to bring relief to his people from the Philistines? He was going to use Samson to create, create tension between these two nations. So although Samson wanted for probably his own personal vengeance... Right? God, God can still, here's the providence of God, right? God can still use that for his glory and to accomplish his purposes in creating conflict between these two, two nations. So God's purpose here is far greater. He's dealing with the Philistines. I'll use Samson to do it, although his motive might be vengeance. I can, he can still use that for his glory, for his good purposes, to begin to deliver his people, and he will do that. So Samson is miraculously, and there's no other way to describe it here, miraculously enabled, right, by God to lean against, and he bows down, and he pushes against these pillars, and the whole building collapses. Killing everybody inside. The Philistines, thousands of people died, including himself. And we, we read that the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his lifetime. His most decisive victory in his death. Who's that sound like? Christ. Right? Christ. And it's, it's more for, for Samson, not just in numbers. Right? The numbers are pretty impressive. But it's, it's who? Right? The lords of the Philistines? Those leaders? 
right? All, all those men, those high dignitary people that were there making fun of him, gone. Right? It's going it's to cripple the nation. <clears throat> then his family shows up. Right? Then his brothers and all his family come down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol, the tomb of Manoah, his father. And Samson had judged Israel for, for 20 years. Right? Did you see, even just in that verse, the grace of God? Right? We, we can miss this, and I miss this. Right? Thankfully, a commentary helped me see this. And, and the grace of God, Samson's family came down. Not just his mother and his father. Who else came down? The brothers. It, it, his parents had more kids. Remember, she was barren for years, right? And he had, she, he had more. He had brothers who came down. So there's, there's, there's a family. It didn't just, well, he wasn't the only child. He wasn't the only son born. And they take him back and they bury him in the tomb of his, his father, God is faithful to his promises. God is faithful to his plan. I'm going to raise up, you're going to have a son, and I'm going to use him to begin to bring relief to the, from you to the Philistines. He does it. Even with all of the, the sin and the rough edges and the head-scratching things that this man, Samson, does, God uses him to accomplish his purposes, to complete his God-given mission to bring tension and strife between these two nations, which David will finish. We get to keep reading the story because we know it's not over. But think about it this way too. You think about the Philistines in that temple offering gifts and praises and sacrifices to Dagon, their God. Look what our God did. God's not going to give his glory to anybody else. Nobody. So I'm going to use Samson to create division amongst these two nations. And how dare they try to take my glory from me. I'll show them. Because God gives his glory to nobody else. It's misguided. Right? Dagon who? So we're at the end of the life of Samson, right? And, and there's, there's probably more questions than, than answers about this man, Samson. But what I want us to do is, is think through the, these things together. Number one, we need to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I've got a lot, so I have put little bookmarks in, so I'm going to get there quicker than you do probably. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 11, 11 through 13, says this. The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Right? Samson's all through that passage in 2 Timothy. But God remains faithful even when Samson is faithless. Right? He remains faithful because God cannot deny himself. He's going to accomplish his purposes through Samson. Right? This isn't a license to live any way we want to live. This is a license to understand who God is and what He has done, and we better live with humility and with a sense of awe of our God. Even in our times of weakness and sin, we are covered by Jesus. We are covered by His righteousness. Right? That, that means we battle sin. That doesn't mean we're like, oh, he's got it. No, we battle sin because we understand and are growing in our understanding of what God has accomplished for us in and through Christ. As we begin to understand how sinful we are and how holy and just and right God is, right, it should force us and want us to, to grow and to battle our sin more intensely each and every day because God is faithful. 
He's faithful. I mentioned this passage, Romans 15, verse 4. Paul says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Okay? So, how do we, we think of Samson, right? Let's, let's just take 14, 15, 16, Judges 14, 15, and 16. How do we live with a sense of hope and encouragement when we read about this guy? I have like eight things, and they're really and not any specific order here. I have eight things. Number one is as we, as we read the story of Samson, as we work our way through the story of Samson, right? There's this theme of what? There's these themes of revenge, manipulation, selfishness, deceit, as opposed to the call that we have to value others above ourselves. To put others before ourselves. To put others' wants and desires and needs above our own. Because I, I don't believe that you can read Samson and think that, oh, well, he just he had his issues. Right? It should shock us. Number two, God had set him apart for a specific purpose. God had a plan and an agenda and a calling for Samson's life. As opposed to the way Samson lived his life. Right? Samson used his God-given abilities for his own desires, for his own wants. Right? He was more willing to have Delilah cut his hair than to stay true to his calling. Right? And, and we see things like that all throughout the story and the life of, of Samson. So it should cause us to pause and to think about, okay, what are my God-given gifts? What are my God-given talents and abilities? And, and how am I using them to, to serve God? And to fulfill his purposes, which is, which is his glory, ultimately, how am I using them? Am I, am I using my gifts to, 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 to help and serve uh, each other? Are we using them to help and serve one another, our community? Or are we using them for ourselves? How are we using these gifts that God has given us? Right? And, and it's easy to miss that when we read Samson because we can get so distracted by what Samson did. But at the end of the day, right, the people of Philist the Philistine people in Gaza were giving glory to Dagon. And God's not going to stand for that. It's his glory. So are we living with God's glory in mind? First Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 31. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do all for the glory of God. Number three, if, if, if there's anything positive, <laughs> right, in, in the story of Samson, if there's anything good in the story of Samson, it's there because of the grace of God and God acting. Samson's a mess. And if we're honest, if I'm honest with you, I'm a mess, right? I need the grace of God in my life each and every day, each and every moment I breathe. There's a reason why almost every Sunday, one of the, the prayer things that we have in there is that his mercies are new every morning. He gives grace upon grace because we need it. We need it. And we need to understand that God's at work in so many different ways, in ways that we can see, in ways that we can't, but he is at work. Number four. <laughs> four and five are probably the same thing. Um, but there's this downward progression, right? We've talked about this downward spiral that we see in Judges, um, and it's going to get even worse um, as we finish up the book here in the next few weeks. But if you just look at the Judges, it starts with Othniel, 
and his faithfulness, and he was the best judge that we have record of, right? And then we end up with, with Samson. But we can't think for a moment that Othniel was sinless, right? We can't, we can't go there, right? All of these people that God raised up had sin in their lives, but God still used them to bring himself glory and to bring relief to his people. Even when they are faithless, God remains faithful to his promises. Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. Through you, many people will be blessed. Nations will be blessed. He's going to be faithful to his promises. And so as much as we can get hung up sometimes on, on the life of Samson or Jephthah, we need to remember that God used them, that they were agents, tools that God used to show his grace to his people and to bring relief to his people. And now we need to, we need to go to, so this is number five, we need to get to Hebrews chapter 11. Right, we've been here before. <laughs> and this is, by the way, someone asked me the other day, why are we going through the book of Judges anyway? We're going through the book of Judges because of Hebrews chapter 11, just so you know. Um, because you get to people, you get to verse 32, and what more shall I say for time with family to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Right? Samson seems to be the worst of them all, but yet he shows up in Hebrews chapter 11. So he's bearing witness to, to, to Christ and, and, to, and to, to the gospel. If you believe that the Bible is one story, God's plan of redemption, then Samson is pointing ultimately to Christ and to Jesus. So Samson should teach us. So we, so we read in that in, verse, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, and we have to go to chapter 12 of Hebrews, and we have to read this, that laying aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and we run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Right? So Samson should teach us to lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. As we look to Jesus, the, the founder and perfecter of our faith. So this imperfect example of Samson is ultimately pointed to the perfect example of Jesus. And we should therefore sit and ponder and reflect and cherish the beauty that is our Jesus. Number six. Right? Samson points to, to Jesus. And, and I'll do this quickly, right? If you just look at the life of Samson, what we have in Judges 13 through 16, he points, he, he's pointing to Jesus, the, the, this divine messenger that, that, that announces his birth, the, the miraculous conception of, of Samson, him being set apart for a specific calling and for a specific mission, the fact that he was in, enabled by the Holy Spirit, the fact that Samson was rejected by his own people, the fact that he was handed over to those who were hostile towards him, the fact that he was mocked and ridiculed and tortured, the fact that he cried out to God at the time of his death to fulfill his calling. There's just so many ways that he ultimately points to Jesus. And so we have to make sure that we make those connections and we see those. Samson, number seven, Samson gives us a glimpse into Israel, right? God had called them to be separate. They were to be set apart. They were to be an example to the nations. But yet they weren't. They kept on going after the foreign gods. That's why they're in this mess after all, because they're not faithful to their God. And they suffer due to their sin and due to, due to their idolatry, as does Samson, right? As do we. Because of our sin, there is suffering that comes upon us. There is suffering that can come upon other people because of our sin. So it's a reminder, again, to deal with sin. It should drive us to confession. It should drive us to repentance. Think about it this way. Um, the Old Testament has the story of Samson. And God has that story there for the nation of Israel to remember their God and to deal with their sin. 
If you fast forward to Jesus, and Jesus is standing there, and Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son, he's telling that story to get the religious leaders to repent and to see their sin. It's the same idea, just different accounts that we would see our sin and that we would repent. We must be careful not to rescue Samson from himself. We must remember that God uses sinful, rebellious, incompetent people to accomplish his purposes, to ensure that God gets the glory that only he deserves. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. We've got to be really careful not to try to smooth things over with Samson, not to try to justify what he did, not to sand down those rough edges, all right? Because the people of the Bible are not heroes to emulate, but people that were in desperate need of God's grace. And now we can have confidence in, in the Word of God because the Bible speaks to that reality Right? The Bible doesn't sugarcoat life. Everything is not rosy. Everything is not peachy keen. And if it was, we've talked about this, it wouldn't seem true. Right? It would seem so made up, but when you get to these stories and it makes us pause and realize how gracious and loving our God is to give us these stories, say, hey, this is the reality of life. People are weak and incompetent. Phil, you are weak and you are incompetent, but for the grace of God, right? But for the grace of God. And so in, in the story of Samson, there's these two little flickers of faith. And, and this should be an encouragement to us. He cries out to God twice. Once when he's thirsty... But he, but he recognizes that it was God who gave him the victory, that he was God's servant, right? So there's that little flicker. But then he is standing between those two pillars in the temple in Gaza, and he cries out to God for, for mercy. Just one, one last time. Based upon, remember me, based upon the relationship that God has with Samson. And God owes nothing to Samson, but he recognized that there's, there's, a, there's a relationship here, and he's praying and begging for God's mercy. So in both of those examples, just those two times, he's doing what? He's acknowledging his dependence on God. By faith, Samson. Like Samson, we are people in need of God's grace. Right? We are people that are in need of Jesus. We are people that are in need of Jesus' finished work upon the cross. We are people that need the gospel. May we never, ever forget. Never forget. And so with this, we're going to transition into communion. Because communion at TVC is something that we do each and every week. And as I have I talked before, it's, it's a way for us to, what, remember, right? That we would never forget the grace of God in our lives through Christ. But we remember and we celebrate. And we celebrate because why? Because we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, which means we have eternity waiting for us. Eternity waiting for us because of Christ and because of his gospel. And so we remember the gospel and we celebrate the gospel. And communion is the meal that, uh, it's the Passover meal that happened in, in Exodus that Jesus had with his disciples in the upper room on that night before he was to give up his life and lay down his life to deal with sin once and for all. And so with this we remember and the bread represents his body that was broken for us. 
and the juice represents his blood that was shed for the covering of our sins. And so with that, we remember and we, we celebrate. May we never forget. That's why Jesus says, you do this in remembrance of me. You do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's why Paul goes on in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. says, for as often as you eat of this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right? You're, you're remembering, you're remembering, you're remembering. Here at TVC, we, 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 we tie in baptism and communion very closely. We see this pattern throughout the Bible. And so we ask that you participate in communion only if you've been baptized. Baptism is that first step of obedience, um, is to be baptized. It's that first step in discipleship. It's that public proclamation. It's that public statement that you are standing with Jesus, that he is your Lord and is your Savior. And then communion serves as just that weekly reminder of remembering the gospel, remembering the gospel in our lives. So if you're here this morning... <laughs> You'll have time this morning. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 right, that we are not to eat of the bread and drink of the, of the cup in an unworthy manner, unworthy manner or we'll be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord and that a person is to examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We don't want you to enter into this light. It's a warning from Paul and to, the, to the church and to us to not enter into this lightly. So we ask you to, to do this work and to evaluate your hearts and maybe there's, there's sin that you need to deal with. That means you need to go to somebody. We're going to ask you to not come forward and deal with that sin first. Maybe there's unrepentant sin that you need to deal with and you need to battle. We're going to ask you to please not come forward, but to, to, to wait and deal with that sin first. We don't want you to enter into this into an unworthy manner. It's the warning. We want to emphasize that warning. <laughs> but it's an opportunity for us to, to remember the gospel and to celebrate the gospel. So I'm going to pray for us right now, and you'll have time to sit quietly and to, to reflect and to do that work with God and that business with God and confess what needs to be confessed, and then you come forward and you'll be handed a piece of bread, you'll be handed the juice, and then you bring that back to your seats and we will partake together this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity you have given us, that you have given your church, Lord, to remember the gospel and to celebrate the gospel through the Lord's Supper. Lord, it's my prayer that we would never enter into this time lightly, that we would do the work that needs to be done. Lord, that when we would confess what needs to be confessed, Lord, but when we come forward, Lord, that we would come forward with such a sense of confidence and boldness, and Lord, it has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with your son, Jesus, and what he's done for us. Lord, that you would help us to guard our hearts and to guard our minds and to guard our lives. Lord, that we would battle the sin that you sent your son, Jesus, to die for. Lord, help us to remember. But Lord, help us to, to celebrate. Because of Jesus, we have eternal life. Because of Jesus, we have a security that surpasses any other possible security imaginable. Nothing can take us from your hands. And I pray this all in your name. Amen.